Now, um, from time to time, we love, we love, we love to share stories of God's redeeming power, and it makes church look a little different, and I like to break tradition. And so, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Lynette just kind of texted me, and she said, hey, I really feel like the Spirit of God is saying, now is the time. And so, I said, I'll check with the person and see. Um, so, um, after hog tying and handcuffing and chaining and threatening lives, we got this person to agree uh, to work with us today. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow Lynette to come and share. And as she shares, she's going to share some things that I think are very intimate. And uh, not that we're glorifying brokenness, but we want you to experience the power of God's redeeming grace. And the story is only half told because of time, really. And so Lynette does an amazing job with this. I mean, if you've never heard Lynette put a story together, uh, you're in for a treat. Not to mention what God will share through the story. Again, don't try to figure out who the speaker is. Um, just let God speak to you through the story. So I want us to give Lynette Carpenter a hand as she comes and shares her gift with us. Amen. Amen. Stretch your hands towards this. Woman of God, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gift you've deposited among us. Today, God, would you anoint it. God, as Lynette steps out of the way and lets you step in, God, open your people's ears to hear and heart to receive. Let her stand in the confidence of the gift you've given her through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Well, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Um, I'm really excited to be able to do this. Mother's Day story. I actually, um, when I was putting things together this morning, I noticed that um, this is the fourth redemption story. And it was on Father's Day that we actually shared Gabe's story. So that was kind of cool. I kind of forgot about that. So um, one thing that we all have in common is that we all have a mother. And so this story can relate to all of us because it you know, our relationships with our moms are so vital to who we are as people today. And um, for myself personally, I enjoy helping people tell their stories just because I, I feel like, I felt like as I was um, a young woman, younger woman, I'm still young, I hope, um, <laughs> that I, it, you know, you go to church and you look around and everybody looks so put together and their life looks so perfect and you think, well, they could never imagine what I have been through because their life is so perfect. But the fact of the matter is, is that we all have stories to share and it, what happens in our past um, turns us into the people that we are today. And so I'm so honored to be able to help different ones share their stories. It's um. It's been an honor for me to be able to help write this one as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the story, and then at the end I'll tell you who the person is. And um, I, I know that you will be blessed by what she has to say. There are times I look back over the course of my life. The twists and turns of events that have brought me to where I am today are not unlike that of the blue and red lines crisscrossing the road map Daddy kept in the back window of his car. As a child, I would, I would lie across the back seat, tracing the endless courses available to us as we trekked across the country. I'd study the town names as we passed by. I'd giggle quietly to myself over town names such as Pig Eye, Bad Water, and No Name. Then I'd let my fingers slide across the state's landing on each place we'd called home. There was South Carolina, Kansas, Hawaii, California, and even back to South Carolina again. <clears throat> my birthplace, though, was nowhere to be found within the covers of the Rand McNally maps of the United States. My father was a U.S. military man, and he had met my mother while stationed overseas. They married, and when I was two years old, they transferred to the states where I was raised as a military brat, moving from base to base across the South. My childhood passes by with snapshots of happy moments blending in together with the bad. Warm summer days spent grilling in the backyard, then huddled in fear as my parents fought on the steps outside. The time Daddy punched Mommy in the belly, and the excitement over the birth of my brother Daniel when I was eight. More nights spent listening to my parents fighting through the thin walls of our apartment and splashing in the pool with my father as he taught me how to swim. Each scene flitting through my memory, some more distant than others, yet each taking their place and forming me into the person I am today. Our family was not an affectionate one. I learned early to hide my feelings and go with the flow, but I was cared for, I was safe, and I knew I was loved, even if the words were never said. I was 12 when the news came. Daddy was being transferred yet again, this time to Japan. 
He was given the choice of taking his family and being stationed there for four years or leave us behind and only serve two. He and mom discussed it and soon we were saying our goodbyes to daddy. We couldn't have known then that the events of those next two years would change us forever. By this time, we were living in California. With dad gone, I began to see a change in my mom. She would invite friends to our house and they'd soon chase me out the door. I'd sit on the back stoop staring at the ants scurrying across the cracked sidewalk, wondering what mom and her friends were doing with the white powder on the kitchen table. But wondering was all I could do. Somehow, I knew better than to ask. Over time, it was not uncommon for mom to send Daniel and I off to bed before she'd slip into the, into the night to party with her friends. In the morning, she'd tell, me how much she loved my, uh, she'd tell me she never loved my father and had only married him as a means of getting me to America. There's no life for you in my hometown, Jean, she would insist. Not knowing how to respond, I'd only shrug and turn away. One night, she came to me, a suitcase in her hand. I'm leaving, Jean. I stared at her. Wh what was there to say? I was only 12. Daniel, 4. Leaving? But what would we do? Who would care for us? My mind raced with so many unanswered questions. Why didn't she want us? Weren't we reason enough to stay? How could a mother choose her friends over her children? Don't worry, she said. I'll make sure the military contacts your dad. He'll come for you. I lay in the top bunk of my bed, listening to the deep breathing of my baby brother sleeping free of care below me. And finally, the soft click of the back door as she left. I turned to stare at the wall as a single tear slid down my face. When I awoke the next morning, I wondered if my dad would arrive to get Daniel and I, but to my surprise, I saw the sleeping form of my mother in the bedroom across the hall. For reasons I never learned, she came back that night and life went on as usual, yet the knowledge that she could so easily walk out of my life left me feeling unwanted and alone. May arrived, and with it the beginning of my teen years, 13. I stood in the kitchen of our tiny apartment, staring at the people around the table, wondering if anyone even knew it was my birthday. They didn't seem to, and if they did, they apparently didn't care. The summer days slipped by, and soon it was autumn. On Veterans Day, Mom once again sent Daniel and I to bed while she looked forward to another night out with her friends. This had become so common, I no longer had qualms about staying home alone with my little brother. Around 4.30 in the morning, I woke with a start. Was that a knock I heard? My heart was beating loud in my ears, and I felt a thin layer of sweat cloaking my body. Then I heard it again, this time loud rapping on my bedroom window. I peeked through the blinds and saw a group of men outside in the white glow of the streetlights. Tiptoeing, I went to the living room, sh shivering with fear, wondering what to do. Open up! The voice at the door was urgent. It's the police. Open up! What do, what do you want? My voice shook a little, wishing my mom was there. It's the police. You need to let us in. No! I tried to sound stronger than I felt. Go away. We need to talk to you, the voice on the other side of the door insisted. Can you please open up? I noticed he was holding out a badge for me to see, but I still refused to believe him. I am not letting you in. I don't know who you are. His voice held compassion as he again assured me that he and the other men were indeed the police and that whatever it was they needed to tell me, that whatever it was they needed to tell me couldn't wait until the light of day. I stared at their badges, uniforms, and their guns for a moment longer, then hesitantly unlocked the door. The men shuffled into the house quietly. After I explained that Daddy was stationed somewhere in Japan, Mom was still out for the evening, and it was only Daniel and I in the house, the police introduced a man I'd never noticed before. His name, I don't recall. I only remember how he trembled as he sat on the chair next to me and explained that he was something called a coroner. It's about your mama, sweetie. He continued to shake, his voice breaking as he spoke. There was a car accident, and I'm, I'm so, I'm so sorry. He paused to collect himself. I'm sorry, but she, she's gone. Your mom, she, she died in the accident. I sat looking at him, unblinking. Okay. Surprise passed over the faces of each of the men as they watched me absorb the news with little reaction. One of the men, one of the policemen leaned forward and explained that my father would be notified and did we have someone we could co call to come stay with us in the meantime. I continued staring blankly ahead but managed to shake my head no. After some discussion between the men, they explained that Daniel and I would be taken to a shel shelter where we would remain until Dad arrived. Quietly, I went to the bedroom where I shook Daniel awake. He cried at the news, but I hurried him along as we quickly dressed and packed a few belongings. I took his little hand in mine as we walked out the door, down the steps, and into the back seat of the police car. Never before had I felt so alone, so scared, and so, so abandoned. We pulled away from the curb, and I gently placed my thin arm around the tiny shoulders of my brother. 
Leaning my head against the window, I stared out into the night as the car carried us away from the home my mom would never return to. Emotions clawed at my soul, begging me to take notice, yet to acknowledge them hurt. I stuffed the pain deep inside, refusing to give it a voice, certain that if I ignored the raw pain searing deep inside, I would, it would eventually go away. Daddy returned from Japan and collected Daniel and I from the shelter. If the apartment had seemed void of emotion, good or bad, while Dad was stationed overseas, the death of my mother cast an even greater shadow across our home. My first day back, I scurried about, doing my best to hide the evidence of Mom's extramarital relationships from my dad. Though I did my best, he wasn't fooled, and one night after consuming several drinks, Dad called out to me, When were you going to tell me about him? I froze for a moment, then chose to act like I didn't know what he was talking about. That rather short conversation was the most we ever talked about what had happened while he was abroad. Whatever he knew, he kept to himself, and I did the same. Within a week after Mom's death, Dad was given his new assignment, and we were crossing the country once again to move back home to South Carolina. South Carolina was where Dad's parents lived, and it was nice to be near family. Dad made no secret that he favored Daniel over me. I felt it most on the nights he'd come home drunk. It was then that the remnants of pain from my mother's betrayal and ultimate death came to the surface. I could feel his disapproval of me, but what was I to do when in his eyes my greatest offense was bearing the resemblance of my mother? I knew Mom had hurt him deeply, yet the subject had remained off-limits over the years. I swallowed the pain and kept moving on. We were strangers sharing a home. Somehow in my heart, I knew my dad loved me, and I hoped he knew I loved him too. Yet it's just that sometimes, sometimes when two people are buried beneath their individual emotional baggage, they find themselves unable to say the words that their hearts feel. And that was what happened to my dad and I. So much hurt, so much pain. It was as if we'd stuffed it all into an old suitcase and carried it everywhere we went. Its presence was never acknowledged or explained, but its weight was real and heavy and felt. By now, I was 14, and after so many years of sorrow, I was ready to have some fun. I started hanging out with the wrong crowd, and it wasn't long before I met a boy that made my heart beat a little faster. He started partying with my friends and I, and I found myself looking forward to spending more and more time with him. Larry was a little older than me, and his attention was like a tall glass of water to my parched, lonely soul. Maybe it was for that reason that I found myself being abused by him, yet refusing to break off our relationship. For him, I was willing to do anything, so when he whispered, if you love me, you would, I believed him, and I held nothing back. And then my world changed. It was a day like so many others when it happened. Larry and I were out looking for fun, hitching rides from one place to the next, one party to the next. A van pulled up beside us and invited us to climb in. We rode around for a while until I began to notice the driver dropping people off here and there. Soon, even Larry was sent packing, and I was left alone in the van with three men. I sat there, nervous and afraid, unsure of what to say or do. I didn't understand why they wouldn't let me out. The driver finally pulled off the road, and I saw through the darkness that we were on a very remote stretch of road with no houses in sight. What followed was the longest and most terrifying night of my life. When the first rape was over, I begged them to release me, but they weren't done. One of the men pulled out a gun and held it to my head. I lay there petrified as he pulled the tr trigger. Click. Even now, I don't know why the gun didn't fire but he had my attention, and all I could do was carry my emotions, my thoughts, and my will to a place far away from that secluded van as those three men spent the rest of the night having their way with my body over and over and over again. They dumped me off at the Air Force Base sometime in the early morning hours. My body trembled with pain from the hours of abuse I had just endured, yet it didn't hold a candle to the weight of pain I now carried within. A part of me died that night. I was so broken. Yet the years of abandonment had made their mark, and I'd learned to hide my pain. As I walked up the steps to the home I shared with my father and Daniel, I gathered my emotions and filed them away. Dad met me at the door. He was ticked off. Where have you been, Jean? I shrugged and pushed past him. I'm talking to you, young lady. Don't think you can just come and go as you please around here. You're only 14, for crying out loud. His words broke the dam I had tried so desperately to build just moments before, and I stopped. My shoulders drooped, and I fell back against the kitchen counter. Tears filled my eyes, and I could do nothing to hold them back. In an instant, Dad's expression changed. Jean, what's, Jean, what's wrong, Jean? He reached out to put his hand on my shoulder, but I pulled away, panicked. No, don't touch me. My words came out in terrified whispers, and I could see a cold fear settling in Dad's eyes. Jean, his, eyes, his voice was deep, still, and filled with dread. You have to tell me. Did something happen? 
I took a deep breath, willed the tears to stop from flowing, steeled myself and looked up into the eyes of my father. Yes, Dad. I was raped last night. That's why I didn't come home. There were three men, Dad, and they wouldn't leave. They wouldn't let me leave. And they did it. They raped me. Dad's anger burned bright in his eyes as he called the police. For a brief moment, I allowed myself to appreciate the security of my dad's protection, but that moment would, be, would do little to convince me that I was nothing more than a failure in the days to follow. The police arrived and questioned me for hours. What were you doing? Who were you with? Where were you going? And with a look that said it all, and with a look that said it all, he asked, is that what you were wearing? I knew it. It was all my fault. I shouldn't have been out with my friends. I shouldn't have worn these clothes. My fault. My fault. My fault. The justice system seemed to agree with my thoughts, and once the three men were apprehended, they sentenced them to serve one year in the penitentiary. One year! 365 days for holding a 14-year-old girl against her will, placing a gun to her head, and gang raping her hour after hour. One year! The price of their atonement said much to my self-worth. I was convinced I had little value, and the courts agreed with me. After that, I cared less and partied more until I began to notice changes in my body. Something was wrong. It was different. I felt different. The pregnancy test confirmed my suspicions, and I trembled as I told my boyfriend that he was about to become a father. Larry disagreed, calling me every name in the book and claiming this child growing in my womb was actually a product of the rapes. But I had looked at the dates, and I knew he was wrong. This baby was his. Larry's anger burned, and he came at me with a violent force unless, unlike he'd ever done before. As I secretly nursed my wounds the following day, I knew it was time. Resting my hands on my still flat tummy, I whispered, It's okay, baby. I won't let him hurt you. A new awareness had settled over me, and I was determined to protect the life growing within me. I told Larry it was over, and he made a welcome exit from my life. Dad didn't share my opinion about the baby when he heard the news, and he began searching for the nearest abortion clinic. No, I insisted. This child was mine, and though I knew little about abortions or babies, I knew in my heart of hearts that I'd been given this little life to love and protect. Dad got Grandma on his side, and even with both of the adults in my life insisting on an abortion, or at the very least, adoption, I refused to give in. So on the day my father first noticed the thickness of my once tiny waist, he opened the door of our home, handed me my suitcase, and invited me to leave. I stood staring at the closed door of my father's home. All the pain I'd acquired through my mom's abandonment, the rejection and ultimate death, it welled up inside me, reminding me of how unworthy I was of love. And now this, 15 and pregnant. I placed my hand on my growing belly and was startled by the rush of emotions that raced through my soul. This child was mine, mine to love, mine to nurture and protect. Whether my father was willing to support me or not, I would find a way to survive. I moved in with a neighbor lady who so graciously offered me a home for as long as I would need. Ironically, my father's backyard could be seen from Mrs. Jacobson's, and I was able to catch glimpses of him from time to time as he mowed his yard or cooked supper on the grill for him and Daniel. I would wave happily, hi, Dad, and found comfort in his simple nod and quiet grunt of acknowledgement. What was going through his mind, I don't know, but two weeks before my due date, Dad arrived, hat in hand, inviting me home again. Maddie arrived in early June. The hospital bed yawned large as it held my tiny frame holding hers. How I marveled at her perfection. Ten wrinkled little fingers, ten curled little toes, soft black hair scattered across her small round head. How I loved her, adored her. I'd never felt anything so powerful, so consuming before. This, this love I now discovered. It was amazing. I basked in the beauty of new motherhood, yet... A question taunted me, begged for attention. I couldn't acknowledge it, for though I knew I would receive no answer, the possibility of what it could be terrified me. When night fell and little Maddie had been tucked into her crater, cradle, I could hold back the question no longer. I lay staring out into the night sky and wondered, if this, this terrifyingly strong passion, if this is the love a mother has for her child, what is wrong with me that my own mother could so easily walk out of my life time after time? No answers came. Only the soft breathing of my baby girl could be heard as I tried to ignore the pain in my heart along with the tears staining my pillow. The next several years passed by as I adjusted to the life of parenting. Maddie was a delightful child, and I relished the many hours we spent together celebrating each first and fell deeper in love with this precious gift. At 18, I got a fir my first job and soon fell back into the partying lifestyle. <clears throat> it felt good to be a kid again, and it wasn't long before I met Jeffrey. Jeffrey swept me off my feet. 
Having been a single mother for several years, I was lonely, and Jeffrey's company was a welcome presence in my life. The carefree days were cut short when another pregnancy test confirmed that baby number two was on the way. My father was angry, and he made no secret of how great a disappointment I was to him. Jeffrey and I decided to do the right thing, and after a quick stop at the county courthouse, I became the new Mrs. Jeffrey. Twenty days later, I went into labor, and soon my little boy's lifeless body left mine. The memories inside that hospital room pained me still, for though I knew my son was dead, the mother heart beating inside my chest still longed to see the little hands that would never hold mine, to touch his tiny toes and wonder over every tiny detail, but that gift was not to be mine. As the chaos of the delivery swirled around me, Jeffrey stood over my bed, his hands covering my eyes. I strained to catch a glimpse of the baby's tiny frame, but Jeffrey's hand stayed firmly planted across my face, refusing me the gift of seeing my son. It is the regret I carry to this day, leaving me wishing I had fought harder to see him. This was my son. He had entered my world as quickly as he had departed. Now he was gone. Death had taken him, and I was left to carry the weight of empty arms and a broken heart. Why had he died? What had I done wrong? There were no answers, and I struggled to find a way to live with my grief. I now found myself in a loveless marriage. Jeffrey was wrapped up in drugs and alcohol, and I became a cus accustomed to his constant barrage of insults thrown at me from his place on the living room sofa. I worked hard to please him, but no matter how hard I tried, he was quick to inform me that my makeup wasn't right and how fat my size 2 frame had become. The verbal abuse crushed me. Each cutting word felt like a knife. It wasn't long before Jeffrey's fist joins for joined forces with his words, and I was left to wonder how my life had ended up in such a mess. About that time, Jeffrey was dishonorably discharged from the military, and he moved Maddie and I to live with his family in Alabama. If misery loves company, we had come to the right place. My in-laws were caught up in a religious movement that I can only describe as cult-like, my mother-in-law being the leader of it. I was taught to not speak to worldly people as they were full of sin. This was my first taste of religion, and I quickly came to the conclusion that if this was Christianity, I wanted nothing to do with it. One day, Jeffrey took my grocery money for drugs. My mother heart reared back fearless and angry, giving me the strength I needed to gather my little girl and move back to South Carolina. Dad was less than impressed to have his broken daughter standing on his front porch, and I found myself once more watching as he closed his door to me. A local couple heard of my dilemma and invited me to come live with them. Woody and Teresa welcomed me with open arms. Though their convictions for godly living were conservative, in my opinion, they loved me without judgment, and for the first time in my life, I got a taste of what it was like to be loved unconditionally. I began visiting the Holiness Church where Woody and Teresa attended and soon gave my heart to the Lord. It was a happy time, peaceful actually. The chaos of, chaos of what had been was over and I drank in the serenity of each passing day. But as they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder and the passing of time soothed my anger towards Jeffrey and eventually I moved back to Alabama hoping we could make it work. But it didn't and it wasn't long before I was homeless yet again. Once more, a local Christian family took me in, and I relished the security I found in their home. But then my husband called. Jeffrey wanted to talk. I agreed to meet him, hoping perhaps he could return some of my belongings as well. To this day, I cannot tell you what happened at that meeting, but the memory of waking up to a broken body, searing with pain, has not left me yet. That was the last straw. As soon as I was able, I collected my battered body and wounded soul and drove downtown to file for divorce. But for my daughter, I was now alone, lonely, and tired. So tired. At only 23, I had lived a lifetime of pain, experienced rejection, abandonment, rape, death, and abuse. I had experienced the stigma of teen pregnancy, single parenting, and now this, divorce. Tears clawed their way up my throat, burning hot. I had failed again. What can you do when you don't know where to go or what to do? Though heartbroken and soul-weary, I did the only thing I knew how to do take the next step. My life situations, if nothing else, had made me stronger, and I did my best to create a happy life for Maddie. My determination to protect my heart sent me inward, closing off everyone around me. Each day I would go to work at a local restaurant, head down, mouth shut, just doing what I needed to do to make it through. My boss seemed to find joy in, fi in getting a reaction out of me, and I couldn't figure out why he wouldn't just leave me alone. His constant teasing and contagious laughter soon began breaking through the walls around my heart, and it wasn't long before Pete and I would find ourselves talking through the night at a local truck stop. Never before had I met someone who I felt so safe with. Every man in my life had abused me up to this point. Why would I expect him to be different? 
Yet day after day I found myself opening up to him, bearing the wounded soul I'd carefully hidden for so long. Ha, huh, new love. It clouds the mind, convincing oneself that this time will be different. And this time in some ways it was. Pete and I moved in together, and for the next year and a half, all seemed to be going well. But then, a new problem, a new pain, and a diagnosis that would change my life forever. It was Thanksgiving, and we had just enjoyed the traditional family meal with all the trimmings when I first felt it. What's wrong? Pete asked. I don't know. I, I just feel so sick. Pete helped me to the couch where I lay down and promptly fell asleep. When I woke up several hours later, I lay there, heart-pounding with fear when I realized something was different. I couldn't move. Pete tried to help, but I screamed out in pain. I lay there for three days, tortured by even the slightest touch. Pete offered to cover me with a sheet, but even that sent shockwaves of pain through my body. A doctor visit was where I first heard the words, rheumatoid arthritis. I was stunned. I thought arthritis was for old people, and I was only 24. The teachings of my ex-mother-in-law plagued me, and I was sure God was punishing me for all the sins I had committed. My doctors helped me adjust to living with the arthritis, along with the diagnosis that I would be wheelchair-bound by the time I turned 40. Inwardly, though, I struggled. Pete had just proposed, and my thoughts waged war with my self-esteem. How I longed to be loved, cherished, yet all I had to offer a man was a broken soul now paired with a broken body. Who would want me? Pete was convincing, though, and one afternoon in April we said our vows while standing in the living room of his father's house. We drove off that night, dreaming of happily ever after. Sure, we had our baggage, ex-spouses and children from other relationships, but we had each other, and the love we felt was certain to last forever. Forever lasted six months. By then, I'd had enough. Happily ever after wasn't as happy as I expected. Besides the baggage we brought into our marriage, Pete worked two 40-hour jobs, and the time apart put a strain on our relationship. I had reached my limit, and I wanted out. As I was making plans to move, Pete ended up at a revival meeting down the street. When he walked in the door that night, I knew he wasn't the same man I'd married. His face lit up with a peace I hadn't seen before, and his words came quickly as he told me about how he had had an encounter with Jesus. I remembered my own salvation experience so many years before and wondered if this is what had been missing in my life. Those days with Woody and Teresa had been short-lived, and I never tried walking out my faith after leaving their home. I lay in bed that night, desperate to find this peace my husband had discovered. I'd been crushed so many times in life, but I was cer and I was certain joy could never be mine. But now, could it? Could life be different than the constant barrage of despair that described my existence? Hope knocked at the door of my heart, and I crumbled, desperate to welcome it in, yet fearful of knowing its embrace only to have it ripped away. That night, I joined Pete at the same meetings that had changed his life, I drank in the words of the pastor who seemed to be speaking directly to my thirsty soul. You are loved, he said. You always have been, always will be. You see, God created you in his image, and you represent his heart. Are you longing for love? God longs for yours. Do you feel alone, rejected, or abandoned? My mother's face flitted through my mind, the one who had first abandoned me. Tears stung my eyes, the pain still raw and real. The pastor went on. God says in Isaiah 49, 15, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. I gasped and looked around. Others were smiling and a few nodded, and I wondered if the man up front somehow knew my past. He invited us to stand as he continued speaking words filled with hope and promise. I don't know how your life has been, where you've been, the hurts you've carried, or the pain you've experienced, but I do know this. Romans 8 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And like the Apostle Paul, I too am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons, not the present, not the future, or any powers, I'm convinced that no heights and no depths or anything in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I knew I could wait no longer. When the music began playing softly, I walked to the front where I met people I never, where people I never met before gathered around and spoke words of life over me. I was changed. For the first time ever, I could see. Up until now, my whole life had been a pursuit for love and acceptance. Yet the weight of all that I carried only served to drag me deeper into a pit of despair. Now, here in this moment, 
I knelt in the presence of my sweet Jesus, and for the first time ever, I was experiencing a love that was pure, complete, and unchanging. My night at the altar changed my life, but I can't say it's changed my circumstances. That's not what being a believer is. You see, I still have arthritis, and I still have a measure of pain from the loss of my mother, baby boy, and most recently, my dad. The memories of painful days will always be with me, but that night I discovered a new way of living. Pete and I stopped discussing divorce and got involved in the local church. Years later, we accepted a call to move north where we now pastor a church. The other day, I noticed an old atlas under a pile of papers in our office, and I smiled. I remembered the days as a child when I traced the lines while bouncing along in the back seat of my dad's old car. The roads that led me to where I am today were full of unexpected twists and turns, some I never thought I'd survive, but here I am. If nothing else, my life is a testimony to the sovereignty of Almighty God. He knew me from the foundation of the earth, and he had a plan for my life all along. Today, my peace comes from knowing that I am loved by the creator of the world, and I now walk in joy because of the hope that comes from knowing that through Christ I can face whatever comes my way. The end. Um, when I first started attending FFM, it's been seven years now, my own life was filled with so much pain, and I tried to keep it hidden. I didn't want anybody to know the things that I personally had gone through. I didn't think anyone could understand. And as I worked on this story, um, I had to think about the verse... I should have looked it up. I don't know if it's Isaiah or Hebrews. I can't remember. <laughs> um, that talks about how we do not serve a high priest who cannot um, understand what we're going through. And Hebrews, yes, thank you. And that's why I am so excited to tell you today that this story is about our pastor's wife. She is an amazing woman who has been through so much. And yet, when I think about the redemption that I see in her life, I'm honored to think that she looked beyond her pain and her past. And she stepped, <laughs> she has to have so much courage to be willing to step into a role that is probably the most highly criticized and judged position in the church today, a pastor's wife. <laughs> and so I think it is so fitting today that we not only share her story, but that as we look at her as the mother of our church, that we rise up and call her blessed. And we honor her today. Would you please stand and join me in honoring Lisa? train of thought. Um, this, this week's kind of been an emotional week for me um, with birthdays and then my husband putting stuff on Facebook for people to say words that are encouraging to me and, and like finally agreeing to share. And probably for the first time this week, I actually read through the entire story that Lynette had wrote because I had started reading. She had been working on it almost a year. She she had it done, and um, I read sections, and maybe got to the second section, and got very busy, and probably tried to avoid reading the rest of it, too, and eventually, I just didn't, and so I was like, okay, well, here goes, so it probably took me a couple hours just to read that, my story, it's not that story, it is my story, um, I claim it, <laughs> um, yes, I fought tooth and nail about sharing, not because I'm ashamed, because I give God all the glory for my life today. But I'm just going to go ahead and start. I'm going to start, open up with the scripture, Isaiah 62, 3 and 4. You shall be a crown of beauty. Oop, wrong. Isaiah 61, 1, and 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, 
to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now I'm going to tell you a story. It was about 20 years ago probably, and we were coming home um, from church that had asked Don to come and preach. And we always have those serious discussions in cars, don't we? Um, and he doesn't look over at me or anything, so you know it's got to be pretty serious. He's driving straight ahead, just looking, and he goes, um, I feel like God has called me to pastor. And I look over at him. You've got to be kidding. And he says, nope. I really feel like God's called me to pastor, still not looking at me. And I said, no, you're wrong, because God hasn't called me to be a pastor's wife. So just get that out your mind right now. <laughs> and um, I proceeded to bawl and started crying and cried the whole way home. I mean, uncontrollably crying. And he doesn't say a thing. <laughs> um, I mean, what's there to say, right? I probably would have bit his head off. But anyhow, uh, I really searched myself after that day, because we didn't talk about it, but I really searched deep within me and said, God, what is it? What, what's wrong with me? Why, why do I feel the way that I feel? I had seen God moving in dawn, and you know, I know God was real, but during that process of me, just my time with the Lord, and trying to figure everything out and trying to understand it. God showed me that these suitcases, they represented my past, which contained my identity. And what I had done was put guilt, shame, unforgiveness, bitterness, fear, rejection, abandonment, all these things I packed away in these suitcases, and I still had them. And even though we had salvation experience, I still had my suitcases, because that's where I found me, because those were things that happened to me, so this has to be with me. I can't be separated from this, no matter how painful they were, no matter how bad they were, that was me. Um, we put things in our suitcases that we think is important. And those things that we think are important is our identity. Like I said, whether good or bad. Um, God showed me during that process that in order for me to move forward, I was going to have to let those things go. And um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. I know we all know that, but sometimes to know that, you know, to grab a hold of it. I mean, I knew it for a couple years, but I obviously didn't grab a hold of it. So, um, that's when I went to my husband and I said, okay, if that's what you think God's called you to do, I support you. <laughs> Just like that, too. Like, you know, dragging my feet. Oh, I hate it when you're right. Or I hate it when God disciplines me. I just, I can't stand it. <laughs> but God, you know, God was wanting to do something in me, and I had to realize that, you know. And so that's the day that I released my past and decided to leave those suitcases behind. Um, it doesn't matter if things in your past were caused by uh, the choices that you made or if it was the choices that other people made. It doesn't really matter. Um, God wants to release you of those things, and he wants to take them away from you. 
Yep. He doesn't want you carrying these, this baggage around. Now remember, probably back in my day, they didn't have wheels, so you actually had to pick them up. <laughs> All right, so, you know, here. I remember Lynette in Nicaragua. Okay, that's what we're doing, all right? That's how we're doing it. We're dragging all that garbage around with us. Um, God wants you to walk in the fullness of who he is. Ephesians 4, 23, 24 shows us, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. You are created in righteousness and holiness and truth. And we are supposed to walk in that. Okay? It's not going to be easy. Um, you're going to struggle. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have good hours. You're going to have bad hours. But as you walk through the refining process of your life and the healing to take place in your life, and even through the trials that are yet to come, God's with you. Yeah. Ephesians 43, 1 through 2. But now thus says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Yeah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. You know, I look back on my life, and you've heard people say it, um, but I... I truly mean it. I don't think there's a thing that I would change in my life, even the bad. Um, I believe that going through those things helped me be who I am today, even when I didn't know the Lord, even when I didn't walk with him or understand anything. When I came to know him, he revealed himself to me, and he revealed his miracles in my life that those things that I thought were mistakes or a big mess, what the world thought was a mess and mistakes, was actually God doing a miracle in my life. Yeah. And he revealed his hand of mercy and grace upon me so many times, because really so many times I probably shouldn't be standing here before you now. Um, the world says I have every right to be angry, bitter, and just a hateful person. But you know, that doesn't hurt anyone else but me and keeps me prisoner and keeps me captive. And I don't want to be where I was 22 years ago, angry, bitter, and hateful. You know, God helped me realize and helped me to lay down the suitcases, the fear, the rejection, the abandonment, the unforgiveness and bitterness. He helped me leave all that behind. God taught me that he provides everything I need along the way. I don't even need that suitcase. I mean, like I said, we pack things that we think we need in there. God actually gives us what we need for our journey every step of the way. Uh, he knows what we need more than we do. And um, he desires so much for each and every one of us. He wants us to be free. He wants us to be free to love him, to worship him, to be able to love our families the way that he loves them. He just wants us to be free of all of our past pains. We can't let our past dictate our future. That's not who you are. You are a child of God. Yeah. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with the endurance with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, I'd like for you to hear a song that really um, 
it really ministers to me, and it kind of goes with all of this, so. What can you do when you're tied to the crowd, yeah, you carry your burdens, heavy like gravity, just let song really ministers to me. Um, I want, I would like to say thank you to Lynette for taking the time to write my story. Uh, it really couldn't have been easy for her because I don't think I made it very easy. I mean, she had to like constantly text me and email, hey, what, what's next? What? I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. Um, I'm just not a spotlight person. I'm good in the background, but, you know. But uh, I'm going to close with this. Isaiah 62, 3 through 4. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Yeah. You shall no more be termed forsaken. In another version it said, rejected. And your land shall no more be determined desolate. In another translation, it said, ruined. But you shall be called. Yeah. My delight is in her. Yeah. And your land married. For the Lord delights in you. Each one of you, no matter what you've been through, 
You are jewels in his crown. You are his delight. Um, As I look out there, I see women that are precious jewels. Some are rubies, some are emeralds, sapphires, diamonds. Doesn't matter which one you are, because we're all different. But we all need the same thing. Because I think all of us are a little rough around the edges. And we aren't quite shaped yet. And we aren't quite shiny and sparkly yet. But we're all the same. And we're all in need of this Lord. We're in need of him to refine us. To make us shine. To make us beautiful. Right? Let go of your past. And let God do that in your life. Let him have complete control and trust in him. So I ask you, what's in your suitcases? Don't you think it's time to leave them? And trust God to provide everything that you need for the journey that he has you on. Because I'm going to tell you, there was a day when I never thought I'd be a pastor's wife. There was a day when I never thought I'd be standing behind a pulpit talking to people. There was a day I never thought I'd go to Nicaragua or the Dominican to minister. I go there to be ministered, to minister, and people minister to me, make lifelong friendships there, and get Facebook messages for prayer and to support them. I never saw myself in this role. You can't see yourself. And you can't see what God has for you because you're too busy seeing yourself because of that stupid suitcase you carry around with you. It's time to let it go. And if you got to let it go daily, dear Lord, let it go daily. Try not to pick that thing up, but if you do, get back to the altar, get back on your knees and give it to the Lord. I think it's time to stop playing around. We've suffered with pain and agony for too long of things that's happened in our past and we need to let it go. And as women and children of God, God has so much more for you. He has so much more for you than that. So please, please let those things go. I'm not perfect. Do I still struggle in areas? Yeah, I do but they don't control me like they used to. I can learn to trust God, and I can turn to him in those times of pain. And I know that he's there, and he's faithful, and always has been. Even when I didn't realize who he was, he was there the whole time. And uh, that's my encouragement to you all, and never to forget how precious you are to the Lord. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, man. Hallelujah. Jean and Maddie. These two were such a gift to my son and I. Um, it's amazing how God can take brokenness, right? And uh, create such joy and love. And as a mom here today, we want to tell you. Come on, T. Come on, T. Who would have known, right? Right? Who would have known? Oh, that's good. Now these two have their spouses of their own. And um, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that in her brokenness, how could she have made the right decision? When everyone in her life was encouraging her. Right? I can't imagine life without little Malin. 
And um, I know that if she'd have made a different choice that day, um, our lives would all be different today. Who knew where we would be, whether we would even be together. And even back then, God was faithful. And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this story as a woman. Whatever you've been through, whatever you've gone through, through it all, God's hand of grace and mercy is upon you. It's, it's upon you. And I, I have lived, I've lived with this story. And, and like I said before, the, the half isn't even told uh, for sake of time. Um, and I'm only aware of God's grace and mercy because of it. And my life has been changed because of it. And for the life of me, I, I don't know. I don't know how you take a gift of God and abuse it. But it happens. And if you have been abused, I want you to know that doesn't change the fact that you're a gift of God. Listen to me, woman. It doesn't change. If you've been toting some suitcases around, we're going to sing a song here. And you want to come and just symbolically lay these suitcases down that you've been hauling around. Shame and guilt and fear and inadequacy and unworthiness because of something that happened to you in your past. I want you to come. People are going to pray with you. Don't hesitate. This is your day, Mom. Everybody's waiting on you anyway. Right? So, I want you to come. Father, I pray over these women today. Life. Life has come. And the enemy's hand has tried to break them. But God, your redempting power is so much more, God, than the, the scheme and plan of the enemy to break the women among us, God. We say today, your grace is sufficient. We say today, your mercy is enough. We say today, God, you have redeemed. And so, God, we pray, would you do what only you can do in their lives right now in the name of Jesus? Would you minister and touch? Would you allow them to understand the great gift and the jewel that they are in your crown? You declared it in your word. So, Father, today, Lord, we just release them from the heavy weight of luggage. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' precious name. We're going to sing. If you want to come. The greatest love of all. If you want to come, just come. Somebody's going to come and pray.